This week on Jerusalem Dateline, a human rights group calls out Palestinians for torturing their own people and religious persecution and anti-Semitism on the rise worldwide. Also, new evidence that the Shroud of Turin could really be 2,000 years old. Was it the burial cloth of Jesus? All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. An international human rights group says Palestinian leaders in the Gaza Strip and West Bank could be guilty of crimes against humanity for their alleged systematic torture of dissidents. Human Rights Watch made the accusations in a report submitted to the United Nations Committee Against Torture. According to the report, Palestinian Authority security forces and the Hamas terror group used solitary confinement and beatings, including whipping their feet and forced detainees into painful stress positions for prolonged periods, including hoisting their arms behind their backs with cables or ropes to punish and intimidate critics and opponents and elicit confessions. Legal expert Jeff Balaban says Human Rights Watch is no friend of the Jewish people or Israel. Every time they report something negative about the Palestinian Authority or Hamas, they feel like they have to take a swipe at Israel gratuitously. If HRW is reporting torture from Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, you can be sure that it is far more pervasive even than they're saying. And it's obviously significant that they choose to report this now because as we know, the situation is grim. Torture is in fact pervasive in the Palestinian Authority and under Hamas. Earlier, CBN News met with Palestinians who had been brutally tortured by their own government for saving lives and preventing deadly terror attacks. Take a look. Most people would call a man who saves the lives of innocent men, women, and children a hero. But if that person is a Palestinian and he prevented a terror attack against innocent Israelis, the Palestinian Authority does not hail him as a hero, but an enemy collaborator and a traitor. I know this isn't right to go and kill people on the street. This isn't right to blow up buses. But that's not the view of the Palestinian Authority, who condemn this man and others as collaborators for helping Israel. Some say thousands of Palestinians underwent torture, even death, for acts the rest of the world would call heroic. That's why an Israeli law firm here is representing 52 accused collaborators and suing the Palestinian Authority for compensation. We have the privilege to uh, represent uh, those uh, Arabs who were tortured uh, to give a little bit of comfort and try to protect those people. The violence took off in the 1990s after the signing of the Oslo Accords between Israel and the PLO. That's what's called the peace process today. Terror was rampant in Israel. There weren't just a few Palestinians that were helping Israel to fight terrorism. The Oslo Accords required the Palestinian Authority to fight terror. But according to attorney Barack Kedem, that didn't happen. The Palestinian Authority that had made a deal with Israel, the Oslo Accords, carried out actions against those collaborators that were trying to prevent terror. The stories are hideous. They took his little sister, a teenager, brought her to the jail, and threatened him. If you don't confess, we'll rape your sister. They had no red lines, so he confessed, but it didn't help. She was murdered. What she went through until she died, we don't know. It's really like ISIS. This man, who will call Baber to protect his identity, was taken in for questioning. They entered the room and asked, when did you start working for the Israeli Shabak? I said, I don't work for the Israelis. This was just one kind of torture he endured. They tied your hands and feet and head. They beat you from every direction until you fainted, cursing from the morning until the night. You're just a dog. In the end, you are going to die and we will throw you on the garbage. We'll do this and this and this. We will rape you. According to Babir, he faced no official charges or had his day in court. His parents couldn't visit and the Red Cross was apparently never notified of his confinement. Every day for seven months, I was under interrogation from night until morning. Beatings, burning my hands, they used everything. Finally, they stuck a copper wire up my private parts and they lit it on fire. After seven long months, he signed a blank piece of paper that served as a confession. He then worked in the prison for more than two years 
until his parents raised enough money to buy his freedom. Mahbir is another accused collaborator. People came to my house, three men. One of them said, excuse me, can you come with us to our internal security of the Palestinian Authority? I said, fine. I couldn't tell them no. The minute I walked in their door, maybe 40 men fell on me and started beating, beating me to death. When they stopped, they left him bruised, bleeding and alone. In the evening, he came to me and the interrogator said to me, I'm Hitler. You know what Hitler did to the Jews? I said, yes. He said, like Hitler did to the Jews, I am going to do to you, collaborators. The beatings and torture went on for a year and a half. Then in 2002, at the height of the Second Intifada, Israel began Operation Defensive Shield in the Palestinian areas. The guards ran away and Mahbir was freed. So he returned to his village, his wife and children. Freedom hasn't been easy, however, for these falsely accused Palestinians. Many don't have Israeli citizenship or medical insurance. Others can't work because of physical injuries and emotional trauma. Plus, they're separated from their families. Fortunately, they now have hope. More than 15 years after the torture ended, their lawyers won a suit, leading to a 2,000-page verdict from the judge, one of the longest in Israel's history. Initially, it provides the victims about $420,000, enough to cover medical evaluations. The next move, determining the extent of their injuries and claiming an estimated millions of dollars in damages from the Palestinian Authority. That money could be deducted from the $200 million in tax money that Israel collects on behalf of the PA each month. The Palestinians will not give it to us. They are giving money to terrorists who kill our brothers and sisters. Attorney Nati Rome says the story is even more shocking. Rome says of the more than 230 human rights organizations they notified, 99% replied they have no means to help. Where is the UN? Where is the EU? Where is everybody who would like to speak about human rights in the Middle East? This is the real story. Only one group took the challenge. We think that uh, dealing with human rights of Palestinians is our ob obligation, no matter what, what our political view is. Mary Shalem, CEO of the Institute for Zionist Strategies, says helping these men is what being human is all about. We have an explanation why I, the other human rights organization didn't want to take care of it. They didn't want to deal with suing the Palestinian Authority. And the other reason, we are dealing with collaborators who help the, the security of Israel. They've taken the first steps in a long battle. Now they hope Israel and the West will join them in standing behind these unsung heroes. Coming up, religious persecution and anti-Semitism on the rise worldwide. While some bright spots have emerged in the Middle East, religious persecution worldwide is growing and becoming more deadly. As Jennifer Wishon reports from Washington, a diverse international coalition is resolved to do everything in their power to stop it. Here in the nation's capital, there are few issues that unite both ends of the political spectrum. One is the life-changing work of ending religious persecution around the globe. Billions live where their ability to worship is restricted or forbidden, from genocide in China to Nigeria, where church bombings are all too routine. If you don't have religious freedom around the world for everybody every time, all the time, and governments enforce that, you are going to have the clash of civilizations. Each year, Washington becomes the focal point for work toward a world where all people can worship without fear. Victim stories are heartbreaking. My name is Yuhan. Uh, I came from uh, China, Beijing. Yuhan's father was killed for practicing Falun Gong. When her family finally got access to his body, they were shocked. The incision uh, stretched from his throat all the way down to his abdomen. And when they pressed his, his abdomen, uh, they found that the incision of uh, the uh, his abdomen was stuffed with hard ice that my father's organ had been harvested while he was still alive. Uh, 
I cannot imagine, I couldn't imagine what he had suffered before he died. There's too many stories that have never been told. They've never been, no one know about them. There's too many people are suffering. Persecution survivor Miriam Ibrahim recounts her story in the new book Shackled, one woman's dramatic triumph over persecution, gender abuse, and a death sentence. Ibrahim says she felt led to share God's will. Because the only thing I did, I accept that will, and I continue uh, trusting God during the trial, imprisonment, and knowing that I count my days before I get executed, knowing that I'll never be able to see my children again. And now, coming out of that situation, Every day I wake up with a miracle in my life, being able to get my children ready for the school, you know, to prepare their lunch and to do what I do today is all his work. U.S. law requires the Commission on International Religious Freedom to maintain a list of prisoners of conscience around the world. The most important thing um, is to put a human face on the tragedy. Rabbi Cooper says hateful anti-Semitism taught in parts of the Middle East has been exported to the West via social media. He points to recent efforts by Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream, based in Vermont, to boycott the Jewish state of Israel. These are people more at home with Hamas. Uh, than with American or American values. And while the summit is focused on persecution abroad, victims urge Americans to guard their freedoms. Liber liberty is taken away incrementally. It's not all at once. In, in most cases, it's not overnight. They say America must remain a beacon for the world. They look to our principles to say, well, here's a country that's getting it right when it comes to freedom. That's something that we can't lose hold of. Rabbi Cooper says there's a sleeping giant in America that could change millions of lives. If you can get every church in the U.S. to adopt one church in Nigeria, just one church, a church to church, people to people, things will change there very quickly. Because if we wait for governments to figure this out, we're just going to keep reading over and over again about the, the body count of, of the faithful going, uh, going up. And now the work continues to change policies that are hurting so many. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. The Shroud of Turin. Is it the burial cloth of Jesus or a medieval forgery? New research could hold the answer. Is the Shroud of Turin the actual burial cloth of Jesus or a medieval forgery. It's been controversial for hundreds of years. Now, new scientific evidence gives credence to the authenticity of the shroud. CBN News Gabe LaMonica has the details. This is the story of a piece of cloth. Seen here rescued from a fire over two decades ago, surviving just the latest in a series of perils across a journey through history. The first gaze upon this mysterious relic resembles a Rorschach's test of damage dating back hundreds, if not thousands of years. Zoom in a little closer though. The stains are real blood. And the faint image of a tortured, crucified man comes into focus. Typical medieval portrayals of the crucifixion show the nails in the palms, but the palms wouldn't support the weight of the body. Look longer and the serene face of that man becomes clear. It seems so peaceful in comparison to the violence that you see uh, all over the, the rest of the body. Brian Hyland is an exhibit curator at the Museum of the Bible. There have been questions about the veracity of this image uh, ever since its first documented uh, appearance in the late 14th century. In 1988, carbon testing dated the shroud back to medieval times. That test has repeatedly been called into question by various experts. The only single sample they took did not represent anywhere else on that cloth because it had been manipulated. Now, a new scientific procedure dates fabric from the shroud to roughly 2,000 years ago. That Italian study is just the latest in a long series of scientific testing including studies of pollen plucked from the shroud with this scientific tape dispenser. 
the pollen samples that were uh, gathered, they, uh, a lot of them are from plants that are native to not just uh, the Middle East, but specifically the area around Judea, Palestine, uh, and uh, Syria, as it was in that time period. There's also pollen uh, from the area around uh, Constantinople. There's a lot of pollen from Europe. The pollen samples suggest a journey of thousands of miles from Jerusalem through modern day Turkey and France, and now Italy, where the artifact has been kept since the 16th century. Some say the cloth housed in the Turin Cathedral is a vessel for human blood, and therefore may be nothing less than the Holy Grail. When you realize that the cloth is a vessel that's containing Christ's blood. I mean, there it is, and it is blood. And not only is it blood, it's type AB, which is the type that's consistent with Palestinian Jews. Still others call this bit of linen a forgery by none other than Leonardo da Vinci. We're saying it's a 500 year old photograph by Leonardo da Vinci. And if that doesn't sound crazy <laughs> enough, we're saying it's a 500 year old photograph of Leonardo da Vinci because he used his own face as the model, because that's the kind of thing he did. Authors Clive Prince and Lynn Picknett even put together their own experiments in an attempt to replicate the religious relic using a bust of the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, and comparing da Vinci's disputed Salvatore Mundi painting to the image on the shroud. I'm no expert, but the shroud was being publicly shown 100 years before da Vinci was born. He was a good artist, but it wasn't that good. Barry Schwartz is a Jewish photographer based in Colorado who was called upon to photograph the shroud in the 70s. I was biased against it. And I even said somewhere along the line to somebody that, yeah, you know, we'll get to Turin, we'll give us five minutes, we'll find the paint, we'll come home, we'll be done. Yeah, it's 44 years later. <laughs> there was no paint, and it's not a painting or an artwork. No brush strokes, and another mystery. It's 3D. Scientists using an image analyzer revealed decades ago that the lights and darks of the shroud image translate into dimensional shapes. A normal photograph records only variations in light and does not record information about the distance the camera was from the subject. Now we'll put a picture of the shroud under the camera. This image is clearly recognizable. This can only be explained if the intensity levels of the shroud image itself are encoded with distance information from the cloth to the body. Now, British filmmaker David Rolfe is out with his fourth film, Who Can He Be?, investigating the Shroud of Turin using the latest tech to digitally extract data encoded in the fabric revealing a three-dimensional model of a man. We can see what I believe to be the body of the crucified Jesus in front of us on a piece of cloth, whereby the only way that that image could have got onto that cloth is a miraculous one, a miracle that emanated from the body uh, with unbelievable amounts of energy but with an infinitesimally short space. No matter the evidence, the Shroud of Turin may always remain a mystery. But for many, this mirror of the gospel, as Pope John Paul II called it, connects them to the divine. Gabe LaMonica, CBN News, Washington. Still ahead, Operation Blessing, helping refugees fleeing Ukraine. Thank you for watching Jerusalem Dayline. We're committed to providing you with unbiased reporting from the Holy Land. Through weekly broadcasts, podcasts, and online media, our vision is to reach millions around the globe with the true story of what's happening in Israel and the Middle East, all from a biblical and prophetic perspective. This is a big vision and is only made possible by the generous support of people like you. Call us toll free at 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash Jerusalem Dateline and make a donation that will help spread the light of truth about Israel throughout the world. As we know, the brutal fighting in Ukraine has led to a flood of refugees. 
One sister who takes care of a younger brother decided they could no longer stay in their home, and they fled to Poland, where CBN's Operation Blessing was there to help them. As the war raged around them in Ukraine, Anya did her best to take care of her younger brother. But eventually, the violence hit too close to home. The other week, uh, a missile was hit, like, literally in the our house. It was like a massive, huge explosion. And I understood that I uh, take care of my brother. I am responsible for my brother. So I decided it's like the best thing I can do is like to flee to the safest place possible. Sadly, there's no safe, safe places in Ukraine anymore. Anya took her brother and fled to Poland. Thanks to Operation Blessing Partners, Anya and her brother received a meal and a hot drink, a warm place to recover from the cold, and most importantly, the hope to continue. Human kindness is like one of the things that helped me going on. I was like going here without like knowing anything. I literally was going into the nowhere with the little money, with the little clothes and everything I have. And I don't know, I'm, I'm just so amazed by his, how kind people can be. Operation Blessing took Anya and her brother to a local church partner. There, they could safely recover before continuing on their journey. I would just say enormous, a huge thank you. You just, this means so much for every one of us. It comes so deeply from my heart. It's, it's such a gratitude that cannot be expressed by anything. I'm, I'm so thankful. Well, if you'd like to help out Operation Blessing, you can go to CBN.com. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blast so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.